Hello, and welcome to the seventh event in our faculty forum series hosted by the Music Therapy Faculty Forum Steering Committee. I'm Andrew Knight, an Associate Professor of Music Therapy at Colorado State University, and along with Vicki Vega at Loyola University, we co-chair the Steering Committee, a group of eight educators looking to host these forums to support music therapy educators and provide a space for important conversations around music therapy education. In addition to the two of us, I'd like to make sure you know the rest of the committee, Susie Sorrell from Malloy, Melanie Kwan from Washington Adventist, Jen Schreibman from University of Indianapolis, Raquel Ravioli from Marietta College, Debbie Gombert from Eastern Michigan University, and Andrea McGraw-Hunt from Rowan University. The mandate of the steering committee is to look at a future organizational structure for shared faculty governance and to create these events to engage in the tasks of the steering committee, which are to establish trust, build community, and create avenues for conversation, and to be conscientious of not taking a side on issues and to serve as a liaison between faculty and AMTA. We have been and will continue to be a group that encourages open and collegial conversation amongst all participants while maintaining independence from AMTA and any other formal music therapy bodies. If you have topics to suggest to us for future events, email any of us individually or at musictherapyfaculty at gmail.com. That's all one word, musictherapyfaculty at gmail.com. Tonight, we are talking about something that may be new for many of us, a topic called appreciative education. This event started coming together in May as the steering committee was reflecting on our events from last year, teaching in the time of COVID, racial equity and music therapy education, new understandings of the certification board for music therapy exam, and many more topics. We were looking for the next direction to kick off our 2021 academic year and found it in our guest for tonight, Dr. Peter Mather. He will start with a short informational bit on appreciative education, and he has graciously allowed us to post his slides for you so you can download those uh, using the Google Drive link that is in the chat. Um, and now I'll pass it over to Raquel, who will introduce him. Hello, my name is Raquel Rahulioli. Um, we're happy to have Dr. Pete Mather here today with us. Um, he received his PhD in Student Affairs Administration from the University of Georgia. Dr. Mather teaches courses in appreciative education, service learning and higher education, student development theory, campus environments, and the history and philosophy of American higher education at Ohio University. His major research interests include service learning, student and faculty outcomes, the application of positive psychology in higher education, and general student affairs practice. And he's currently a faculty at Ohio University. Thanks for being with us, Dr. Mather. Thank you, Raquel. And I should mention that Raquel is um, one of our doctoral students, and she took this class with me last spring, and um, the appreciative education class in which we went over some of these ideas. And I think that's what led ultimately to us being together here today. And I just want to add one little note. Um, I'm on a year-long sabbatical right now. I have been out for two months. I'm living in a little, mostly, in a little um, car top tent. And I'm just gonna, at the risk of distracting you too much, I'm gonna put a little picture, some images of the, the small tent that I have on top of my car that I'm living out of. And this, this is actually, well, last night in two months was the first time I've stayed in a hotel. Um, I'm in Seattle right now, although I'm originally from, I mean, I'm, I started out in Ohio and I plan to circle around the country. And I, I'll just, I, one, one way that this idea of appreciative education relates to the, um, the, the sabbatical choice I made to do this travel. I was thinking about, um, you know, what do I do at this point in my life? How do I wanna spend this time? Other than doing, of course, the writing and the project that I'm, I'm working on. But I thought back to some of the things that I enjoyed most in life, the things that had given me the kind of the high point experiences. And I thought about times when I'd been outside, thought about times when I, particularly when I was a young man, um, kind of sitting on a perch, looking down into a valley and just feeling filled up by the experience. And um, even though I had not camped in the last 25 years, I decided that this is what I would do. And I, I, I was a little bit, it was a little bit daunting getting things together to do it. But I have to say that it's, it's been everything I hoped for in the first two months. And um, so, but I, I'm, I'm happy to be able to do some um, sort of like teach a class, I guess, um, with you all 
during this time. And I'm what we're going to do is go through. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of a presentation so you understand kind of the foundations of appreciative education. Let me go ahead and share the PowerPoint. Let's see if I can maneuver this. All right. Um, you can see, by the way, I called it for thriving music therapists. We, we use words in appreciative education like thriving and flourishing, and I'll explain that to you in a little bit. But um, essentially, the goal is to learn how to apply appreciative education to your work um, with students, with colleagues, with your um, community, and with yourself. And so I'm going to start, as I said, with kind of a little presentation um, on appreciative education theory, appreciative theory, and then we're going to do an application which will involve um, some breakout rooms and some activities together. And then at the end, um, I hope that that will then translate into commitments that you can make for the year that will help help you think about, the goal is to think about how to have a year of thriving um, educational opportunities with your students. So um, move forward. So just kind of the introduction is appreciative education really grew out of a phenomenon that was happening in the 1990s. And that is, and some of you may have heard of positive psychology. Some of you may have heard of appreciative inquiry. Um, I'm guessing that maybe nobody has heard of asset-based community development, but maybe some of you have. So I'm just going to speak quickly about these pieces. And po positive psychology, in 1998, Martin Seligman, who was, who's a University of Pennsylvania professor of psychology, um, was the president of the American Psychological Association. And he pulled together a group of prominent psychologists and who all seemed to be in agreement with something and that there was a problem in the field of psychology, which is that they focus too much on problems. That is, um, you know, we, and we know actually it's important to deal with psychological issues of mental health and um, our students, it's, it is a major issue with our students, right? But um, we don't, what, what Seligman and others said is, we focus so much on issues of depression, anxiety, and so forth. We don't really study what creates thriving individuals, what fosters and cultivates thriving individuals. And so, um, they, so they kind of gave, gave a clarion call to the field of psychology to say, we need to like look at how to help people be at their best, not just to, um, mitigate the problems that people have. So that's that that's basically the essence of positive psychology or the foundation of that. In the very early 1990s, um, appreciative inquiry, uh, speaking about appreciative inquiry, at Case Western Reserve University, the School of Management, there was a doctoral student named David Cooper Ryder who was studying change approaches in organizations and um, and what he found basically was that organizations that focus on trying to mitigate problems don't work as effectively or as sustained changes as those approaches in which there's a focus on leveraging what's already working at institutions or leveraging what is the best in institutions. So in both of these cases, positive psychology and appreciative inquiry, there's this move away from a deficit orientation to really looking at assets. And then asset-based community development came out of some, um, some work at Northwestern University in Chicago. Um, and it, in particular, it came out of a, an area where people were looking at poor communities, developing poor communities. And, um, essentially, the, the philosophy around asset-based community development, kind of as the, as the name implies, is not going into poor communities and just looking at the problems, but going into 
even economically poor communities and, and looking for the assets and again, leveraging the assets um, to, to improve then the community. So all three of these thing, um, approaches started theories started at about the same time, all independently, but there was an acknowledgement by all of them in the latter half of the 20th century in particular, that there was so much of a focus on problems and deficits. And by the way, I wanted to say, if anybody has questions along the way, you can put them in the chat. And I guess Andrew or Raquel, if you wanna just keep an eye on that, that would be good. Um, and Raquel, how many people are on right now? We've got um, 28, including you. So I was thinking six breakout rooms with four to five people, Is that does that work? Yeah, yeah that sounds good. Okay. Okay, so, um, you know, <laughs> So even though you know we're, uh, these issues of focusing on, on assets to improve things is important, but the reality is <laughs> that there are problems. I mean, as I drive through, we have, I know some, some of you are from the mountain states. Um, I look at, I see the haze and I, I have actually in part of my writing during this time, um, I use the language, the world is on fire. I mean, we know we have a lot of problems, right? And so this is not to ignore the problems that we have. It's about what do you do? How do you move forward understanding that there are problems and challenges? So I'm gonna give you an illustration from um, my home campus, Ohio University. This is, um, this is the first building on campus um, Ohio University started in 1804. It was the first university in the Northwest Territory. And um, this is Cutler Hall. The, the, the university was founded by Manasseh Cutler. And um, over time, we, you know, we're a beautiful little um, quintessential college campus in Southeastern Ohio and the Appalachian foothills. It's, um, it's a wonderful place, but it, it turns out it's a wonderful place for young men and women to go to party, among other things. So a few years ago, it was a summer day on campus and things are pretty relaxed. I had been in my office and I decided to walk over to see my friend who was the Dean of Students. And I walked into the office of the Dean of Students and there was much gnashing of teeth. There was something going on that day. And, and the issue was that Ohio University had just been named the number two party school in the country. It was around 2007, 2008, I guess. And so, you know, over time, I mean, follow, following that, there was a lot of attention to not being a party school. Let's see, you know, all the the top administrators got together, student affairs staff, um, people who you know pay attention, who really work on these issues on campus. And what they talked about was how do we not be a party school? And they talked about creating new sanctions for drinking on campus. And they added an educational um, uh, alcohol education program on campus, mandatory for new students and you know a series of things. And two years later, we were not any longer number two on the party school list. We were number one on the party school list. <laughs> so, so um, and, and uh, of course, you know, this is not a, an objective uh, measure, right? But, but I, I remember after um, we, we arrived at number one, I sent a, a message to my friend at, um, who was the Dean of Students and I had just seen an article from the Huffington Post of the top community engaged universities. And I said, why don't we think about moving towards something like this list and not just moving away from a list? So if you get the idea here that the idea with an appreciative orientation is to think about what is it we want to be. And if we think about and work toward what we want to be instead of what we don't want to be. My, the theory behind this is that you're gonna have more success, right? Um, and, you know, I, I joked with people, we, 
you know, a good thing about our students is they are very socially engaged. And we know that learning occurs when people interact a lot. Now, they don't necessarily need the lubricants that they're using for all those things, but there are some good things that we could leverage and they're, they, we could use that leverage for them to engage with communities who they, you know, and interact with people in, in local high poverty communities, us being the, the poorest county in Ohio. Um, you know, so there are a lot of opportunities for that, but, but there may be other things that we could say as a community that we want to be. So you get the idea. So why do we do this? You know, this is common for all of us, whether it's individuals or institutions, organizations, we tend to often focus on the problems and the negative. And if, if anybody wants to give a, I mean, I believe this is an example all of us can appreciate and understand. And that is, think about when you get your teaching evaluations at the end of the semester. And I'm sure we have, you know, everybody here is a good teacher. You, you're here, you're paying attention, to, you care about education, that's why you're here, you care about your field. I mean, I, at the end of a semester, I get good teaching evaluations. And let's say maybe if I teach 25 students, I might get like 22, 23 really good evaluations and two or three that are not so good. Sometimes they might be pretty negative. Sometimes they might just have a couple of negative comments. What do I give more attention to? Probably the same thing that you would give more attention to, and that is the negative comments, right? So we are disposed generally, we're wired this way as human beings. To, in, to different degrees to focus on the negative. And, and there's an evolutionary reason for that. And, and so for instance, um, well, our, our ancestors way, way, way back were surrounded by threats. And our ancestors that survived those threats were the ones who had really high threat sensitivity, really high fear mechanisms wired into them, right? So, so we inherited those. And first of all, I want to, I, I just want to say I'm grateful to my ancestors who had high threat, threat sensitivity. And we should all be, because otherwise we wouldn't be here. The, the bad thing is, the negative thing is, the challenging thing is that we have inherited sensitivities to be more attentive to the negative than the positive. And so, and, and even there's a lot of research that shows that pessimism is stronger than optimism, even when optimism is warranted. You know, there are times we want to be um, <laughs> cautious and somewhat pessimistic, but usually, and it's only like in really kind of risky situations, but usually, normally we want to be, um, you know, it, it makes sense to be more positive. And there, there's a lot of research out of positive psychology in particular that talks about the, the adaptive qualities of positivity and emotional positivity. But I'm, we don't have time to get into that right now. Okay. So let me, let me just mention in my, I've been doing a lot of hiking through the mountain states and I've, I've had two bear encounters, by the way. Um, one was from at a great distance. And so, you know, I was on one side of the canyon, the bear was on the other side of the canyon. It wasn't likely that the bear was gonna come down and come back up. I had another one that was a little bit closer, call, but, um, but, and they were both black bears, but this is a grizzly bear in front of you. And what I want you to do for a second is imagine yourself being out on a trail in let's say Montana, and you're out by yourself hiking on the trail, and in front of you, a big grizzly bear appears. And I just want you to picture that for a minute. Imagine that, that you're standing there by yourself and a grizzly bear is towering over you and looking down at you and its claws and fangs are showing. You, can, you might even close your eyes for a second so you can really imagine this, this grizzly bear towering over you. Okay. Uh, now, I imagine you all have the grizzly bear in your mind. So I'm going to ask you to stop thinking about the grizzly bear. So don't think about the grizzly bear. 
whatever you do, do not think about the grizzly bear. And if I asked you now, what are you thinking about? Most of you would probably say the grizzly bear, right? So, um, so there are certain mechanisms for helping us get out of just focusing on the problem area. So today we're gonna actually, now we're gonna get into the activity and exercise built on this idea of appreciative inquiry. You can see appreciative, which is um, the foundational name for appreciative education. Um, and, and so just to break down the term appreciative inquiry first, it's appreciative in that it starts with an affirmative topic. So again, this, is, this was developed around organizational change. And I will say that the appreciative inquiry people and the positive psychology people are talking to each other quite a bit now and understanding there's a lot of overlap between the individual and the collective. And so, um, but the idea is if, you know, your college does a strategic plan or something, they can start by identifying the problems or they can start by saying, who is it that we want to be? Let's, and so maybe in this case, we're gonna say um, each of us wants to be the best teacher that's coming here. And so that's our affirmative topic. How are we gonna be the best teacher that we want to be, the best educator that we wanna be this coming year? And so that's the affirmative topic. And then you go through this cycle, discover is really, a, and we're gonna do something like this, where you actually try to examine through questions, through inquiry, what is the best of what is? And then that's the first D. The second D, you build on the best of what has been, what is, and you imagine from that what could be. That's the dream. And then you, you, know, you develop an idea, a vision, a dream, and then you design you, you design, how do I get to that dream? And so there's a design process and then there's the deliver, which is actually doing it. And then you cycle, go through the cycle again, because you don't, you don't ever settle. That's actually another D that sometimes included, don't settle. Um, it's a continual process. So in order to do this, um, let's see, Raquel, do you, Raquel's going to put you into groups and um, she's going to put these questions, put the question in the, um, in the chat, I think, right? Yes. Raquel. And yes, I have a. Okay. And then we're not going to use the Google Drive yet, I don't think, right? For this one. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So, um, the, so, what I want you to do is in your groups, tell your partners about a high point experience you've had in teaching. And a lot of times what we do in appreciative inquiry is tell stories. So um, really want you to try to set the context and describe what, what happened that made, what was it about this situation? What happened and what was it about it that made it a high point experience? And I gave just some examples to help you. Um, for instance, when students really felt turned on by an idea practice um, from your teaching, um, or you felt connected to students or the ideas that you were teaching them, um, or it was just something that prompted you to think and feel like, it's times like this, I know I'm doing the right thing. So those are some examples. Um, so what we'd like for you to do is, um, Raquel is gonna put you into groups, send you into, in, into rooms and, um, and just answer that, that basic question about, or, or statement about, tell about a high point experience you've had in teaching. So, We'll do that for, I mean, if they're going to be how many people in a group? Raquel? Four or five. Four or five. So, I mean, it's going to be a good 10 minutes probably in the, in the rooms and we'll check in and see how you all are doing that. And just a reminder, the breakout rooms will not be recorded. Um, so I will send you to your rooms. Raquel, should I go into the room? 
You can if you'd like to. Um, I think as co-host, you can go to any room you'd like, I think. Okay. So I'll wait just a few minutes and before going. And I will be joining a room as well. Okay. Was that all right to start? It's great. Okay. I'm gonna stop sharing. All right, I'll head to a breakout room myself. Okay, thanks. Thank you. What are you doing? I guess we're all back now, right? I think by not by choice necessarily, but we all wound up back in the same same space. Um, and what what we're going to do next? And let me. So this this is typical. And I part of what we're doing is we're going to go through this process to try to help you all get started out this year, but also so you learn the process and and can implement it in different ways. Um, and your institutions, but what's common is to do kind of small group breakouts like this. Often it's pairs, by the way, pairs telling each other stories. And then you move to a slightly bigger group and you share across groups. These are the things that stood out to us. And, um, and, and then, you know, you start to develop a theory, if we will, you know, if you will, kind of a, a theory about um about whatever the you know the goal is the, the, the appreciative topic is um so in this case you know we're going to develop a grounded theory kind of loosely on um on what ha has really produced high point experiences for this community of um music therapists you, you music therapy educators so um, so what we're going to do, Raquel, are you there? I'm here. Okay. <laughs> um, we, we're going to go into, I think Raquel is going to probably put the rooms together so that two rooms together, probably going to pair the rooms. Yep. Okay. And, um, and what, what we're going to ask you to do, there's a link to a Google Drive or Google Sheet. And um, there are going to be group numbers for each group. 
I don't know if, if the groups will know their numbers, but we'll need to make sure that you do. And we'd like for you to go to the, the Google Sheet, easy for me to say, um, Google Sheet, and there will be a tab that will designate your group. And the question that we just asked is going to be listed. And we'd like for you to, out of that, list some, some of the just main ideas in response to that, that come together from your group. What are what leads to the high point experiences in, um, that you've you've discussed? And so you can kind of summarize them. Um, first, you'll need to obviously share across the two groups kind of the, the main points that came out in, in each of your groups. And then you'll um, start adding, you know, notes under the, the question. So Raquel, any other instruction there? I don't think so. Um, as you join your breakout room, we've got room one, three, and five now. So just pay attention to what group you're in and you that will be your group for the Google Sheets. All right. I know one one group was in the middle of something. I mean, they'll it'll they'll be fine in the minute, Raquel, but I, they're not going to jump right back. I don't think that's fine. In the meantime, I'll put in the chat here the survey for after the um, town hall, where if you click on the link, you can give us the faculty steering committee some feedback on what you liked, what you'd like to see more of, and what you thought about the event. Let's see. Is is everybody back now? 28. I think that's everybody, right? Yep. So, so why don't we have each group um, do a, just a little um, two to three minute presentation or less of your, um, your ideas, how you came up with your ideas. And, um, and some, some people actually have a visual, I know, if not all the groups that you could, somebody in the group could share or put on the screen somehow by the, through their camera. Um, so who would like to go first? I think group one would like to go first. I'm in group one. I'm wondering uh, actually if I'm just looking around here and I'm seeing if the screen share thing is still available and if 
It is. Uh, Debbie, if you still have some of those images up. So I have two of the images. I can walk then, us through the, I can then, go through the uh, themes that you typed up and, and then you can Emily do the image. Okay. You want to go through the themes and we'll do the images? Go ahead. Yeah. But I mean, sh go ahead and sh go ahead and put the images up and I'll just talk over it. For okay. A second. And Debbie, I'll, I'll put the link to the other one back in the chat. Okay, great. So I didn't, we didn't choose this, choose of the images we could, let me do share. Of the images we could have, we, we talked about um, the idea of a labyrinth and in particular the idea of not of the students not quite knowing how close they are and sometimes guiding and sometimes not guiding and the thing that i brought up about the labyrinth is that you can be really close to being to the center and not realize how close you are and at other times you can be you feel like you're close because it looks like you're almost there but you're not actually far away so we talked about that and i'll let andrew relate it to the words we had yeah i think debbie actually helped me kind of find a little bit more of what I was looking at the the one of the themes that we had here was in the way it's typed up it says about helping the student find slash affirm the best in themselves and the just the so the notion of find for me um made me initially think of like a garden maze or something but I think that description that Debbie just provided at the labyrinth actually I think is a little bit more accurate because <clears throat> because it's a little bit more about you you're going in and you're not exactly sure where where you are at different points in time as a student and as a faculty are we you know kind of floating above them and helping them you know find that way around or or not and then some of these others you can see um high moments not about theories or techniques oh. but when students humanity that's okay i've got it on my own okay. um but when students humanity comes through um and then this idea of spontaneity in the moment letting the students curiosity take the lead um those also led to a couple different uh, images one of uh, kind of letting birds out of a hand and another one was either like a helium uh, like helium balloons or or hot air balloons and in both cases it's like where are we positioned as the faculty uh, as the as the educator in that moment are the we are we the ones just trying to kind of seed control over whatever is happening um uh and, and allowing you know that student ideas and their personality to kind of take the, take flight um and this and this one in particular that debbie has a, up right now you know we liked it a little bit more because it also had that collective experience so you're not alone walking the labyrinth you're not alone you know bird it's just you know it's not one student to one educator necessarily it's all of it happening at the same time anyone else want to chime in with any more context so, Laura, for you really drove the image of the balloons i don't know if you wanted to yeah, and just I wanted to add to the idea of um, uh, a weight, you know, a student ha holding onto the string and uh, ready to go. And then what is waiting, waiting it down? Is it is it us? Are we keeping that student from flying and soaring? And then um, we also talked about joy and peace too. There was an image we talked about with um, with birds flying off a person's hand and taking flight. Right, and peace associated with that, and the joy also that goes with the balloon release, um, being part of that experience, especially the collective experience of discovery and, and taking flight to reaching, helping someone reach their highest potentials. That is so resonant with um, the ideas around appreciative education, right? The, I mean, the idea of the thriving student, and um, there, there are some tools, and and we don't have time to get into it too much. But some of you may know about the strengths assessment, like Gallup strengths. There's also a, something called Via Strengths Values and Action Strengths, which is a free online strengths assessment um, that. Uh, we use like often with leadership programs with students and stuff like that. But if you're mentoring students in a, um, you know, do, doing some kind of strengths assessment and then doing some activities where they actually ground and really reflect on their strengths is, um, it, it can be really beneficial. Another thing when the, the very first thing that um, that was mentioned here was was the, you know, students at their best and. Um, Another thing is to 
have students describe when they are at their best as a music therapist, when they see themselves um, as a successful, see themselves in the future as a music therapist, what does that image look like? So either to, for them to draw a picture of that or to, to provide some kind of descriptors about that, it could be a conversation about, you know, um, how they can get to that goal and how they can achieve that. And it, it's, it's good to sometimes not get bogged down in the moment, right? And sometimes think about what the ultimate goal is and that that's, and it, it could be shaped differently for different students. And so that can be a, a fun creative exercise. Okay, well, thank you to group one. Let's go to group three. Prana, do you want to summarize some of the notes you took and Prana, you're muted. You're muted. That was because of what we were going to do. Okay, I'm unmuted now. <laughs> All right, let me go back to the Google Doc. Okay, so we had a real lot of um, themes that came out of our experiences. Um, and then and then we started to brainstorm about how we would represent them. And we talked about doing improvisation, creating together in the moment, doing play, making a word cloud or an orf chant or having this Hoberman sphere, which actually we do have a picture of just a second and and using soundtrack um, but we didn't have time to create the soundtrack um adrian can you put up the sound cloud the word cloud excuse me and then i'll look for the um the thing with the yeah absolutely so we just made this quickly a couple of versions this one doesn't have any repeated words so you can see a little bit of the themes that came up And then um, this was one of the ideas. Let me go back again. Uh, okay, can I, just a second, I need to go back to sharing. Sorry. Okay, share screen, okay. Uh, here. People were talking about, um, the expanding and colors shooting out and things like that. So this is called a Hoberman sphere. <laughs> so that was um, that was one of our group's ideas. And Eugenia, can you explain a little bit what we were going to do? I'll stop sharing this. What we were going to do with the sound trap? Sure. Let me share my screen real quick. I don't know if everybody. Whoopsie. Just a sec. Okay, so can you see my screen? Yeah, perfect. I don't know if everybody has used Soundtrap, but this is a collaborative a platform. It's really cool. And I've used it with my students. And you can actually improvise. You create tracks here. And you can do either loops or play or actually record your voice either. There are a lot of options and you can be uh, do some effect um, editing, and it gets to a really sophisticated part of it. What we were going to do is record our a little bit of a chant, every person uh, using one of the words and creating a collage of our voices. We didn't have the time, though, but we just wanted to share. <laughs> That's it. Right. Thank you. That's it. That's great. Group three. Um, and group five. Tara, I can't find you. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, Susie, <laughs> okay. do you want? Um, <laughs> I was going to say, so, Susie, why don't you speak? Yeah, we didn't have anything so fancy. Everybody's are so fancy. But we had a really good discussion, right, group five? <laughs> um, and we worked with analogy and metaphor a little bit. And um, 
I, I think, you know, one of our bigger ideas, but we had two, two ideas. Um, the idea that we primarily spoke about was the garden, the idea of a garden, um, and, um, and the soil and planting. We had a lot of ideas about the garden and, and what we are, who we are as educators, creating the garden, including a fence and plant, putting the soil and the seeds and there it is, Ricky. <laughs> and, um, so, right. Yeah. And, and finding ways to, you know, help the garden grow. But then we started to talk about different ways that, um, the different plants interact. Um, and so that the students themselves, the plants, the flowers, the vegetables, um, and the roots can come together. But can somebody else maybe speak about that aspect of our discussion? Like Leslie has the garden or Tara. <laughs> well, I know one thing that really stood out to me is that in the garden, um, it doesn't always just go one way and seeds drop and plant other seeds. And I also liked our discussion about, com uh, what is it, comparative gardening, where you might have herbs next to flowers and stuff like that. So yeah, there's companion. diversity. Right. Yeah, yeah, companion planting, it's called. There you go. And um, you, you, might, you, you intentionally plant things together so that they can feed each other and help each other. And we, we got cut off, but Janice was talking about energy and how that's such a big part of her teaching experience and how the energy of the room really has an impact on whether she feels like she's pushing something or whether she's getting. And um, I, I was about to say before we were cut off on time, I, I was thinking about the energy in the garden, whether it's the wind or the rain or the sun, you know, and all the things that impact the environment. Um, and that changed the energy and that changed then the way that we teach and that the way students learn. And some of that is in our control and some of it is not. Um, but how do we deal with that energy? And I don't, I may be taking your metaphor in a, in a different direction, Janice, but maybe you can talk about energy. Well, just that there's this group energy and at times it's very exciting and ideas are being thrown at different people in the group. But certainly there are other times when I feel like I'm pulling a wagon behind me and the energy is not there. Well, Group 5, thank you very much for that. I mean, I, I guess just since we just have about five minutes now, um, if we could, um, I, are there just a couple of are there comments just about the process? And let me uh, let me just kind of summarize that we've done basically a very quick discover and a dream. And really to ground it then, you know, from the metaphor, from the ideas, the image into practice, it's design. So I'm going to actually ask you all while this is fresh after the session um, to really think about writing down two or three commitments that you could make that you believe would help um, create the garden or the other images or the music or whatever um, that, that you're imagining that your classroom or whatever your educational context might be. And so that, and then, you know, kind of be thoughtful about, you know, what, what kind of steps might you need to take in order to bring that about. And sometimes, you know, as we know as teachers, sometimes the simplest things that we just step back and think about and, and are intentional about can really um, make a difference. And I, one thing that I would say from the last group that, that stands out to me, um, I was hearing community that I, I was th hearing a lot about, you know, kind of how um, a community is built and that's kind of a, um, a rich learning environment. And there are some tools in, in this field, appreciative education. I don't have time to go through it now, but it is on the slideshow. There are some, some questions that I um, put on a final slide that you all have access to, which might be some things that you could ask either individual students or to get your students engaged in conversations around these things as kind of a warm up activity in a class. 
maybe in just a community building because building a community makes for a, a, a rich learning environment. So with that, we only have three minutes. I'm gonna see if, if the leadership team has anything that any kind of business that they need to take care of. So I'll pass it on to, to you all. Sure. Thank, thanks, Pete, for uh, for some great content here and facilitation tonight. And particularly thanks um, to even spending time with us as a steering committee months ago to get us, to get us excited about bringing this particular event together. Uh, and thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. And on behalf of the rest of the steering committee, thanks all of you for attending and, and being so active um, for this evening's event. We've asked everyone to take a short survey at the end of each of the faculty forum events. I've got that link uh, in the chat right now. It's also posted on the Music Therapy Fair uh, faculty Facebook page, so people can click it there. And then, um, as uh, Raquel mentioned earlier, we'll all have to have a video of this. So if you uh, if you enjoyed the event, or if you, and want to tell somebody else about it, uh, or if you uh, would like to watch it back yourself um, for different parts of it, just large group parts, uh, that'll be available on our YouTube page. And uh, Raquel will send an email out from our that that uh, broad email address, musictherapyfaculty at gmail.com. Um, and if you have any questions or comments for us, please email us uh, right there at musictherapyfaculty at gmail.com. But again, make sure you can just click and take that short survey sometime tonight or tomorrow or find it on the Facebook page. Uh, that's all we have uh, for this evening. Thank you all very much and have a good rest of your, uh, could have, have a good rest of your week as we all kick off our semesters too. We're looking forward to seeing you for our next event uh, coming up soon.